to begin the second half of the program with some introductory remarks by Brother Zafar Bungish. Please join me in welcoming Brother Zafar Bungish. Brothers, sisters, uh, honorable guests, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I welcome you to this program. Uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, it's a two part program. One part uh, relating to Islamic History Month, about which we had uh, some brief talks. And the second part we thought we will dedicate to Kashmir. Today is October 27th, which is historically observed as a Black Day in Kashmir. The reason being that it was on October 27th, 1947, that the Maharaja, the ruler of Kashmir, uh, an unelected, self-imposed ruler on the people of Kashmir, although he had fled the state capital because there was a public uprising against him, uh, but under pressure from the Indian government, he signed what is referred to as the instrument of accession. Now that instrument of accession, of course, was only a provisional measure whereby India agreed and promised and pledged that once law and order was restored in Kashmir, that a referendum would be held over there for the people to determine their own future. Now, if you look on my left side, we have got some pictures uh, that depict the suffering of the Kashmiri people, but also there are uh, certain uh, narrations over there that outline both Nehru's pledge, Nehru being the first Prime Minister of India. Uh, in that pledge, he stated quite categorically, and this is on record, he made that pledge on Indian radio, he made that pledge in a telegram to the Prime Minister of Pakistan at the time, he even pledged to the United Nations that there would be a referendum held over there. And then there is a, also a copy of one of the Security Council resolutions, just a, a brief aspect of that resolution, that we have also uh, printed out. And there were about, altogether from 1948 to 1998, uh, there were approximately 18 UN Security Council resolutions. Each, of, each and every one of them reiterating that a referendum should be held in Kashmir. Now, regrettably, today we face a situation whereby far from India honoring its pledge to hold a referendum, as you know, on August the 5th, uh, the Indian government led by Narendra Modi abrogated the special provision of the Indian constitution, Article 370 and Article 35A. And I want to give you a brief background of these two articles. Article 35A actually dates back to 1927, long before India came into existence. And this was an article that the Kashmiri state, or this was the law that the Kashmiri state passed, saying that non-Kashmiris were prohibited from purchasing land in Kashmir, because they feared that non-Kashmiris, if they were to come into Kashmir, they would change the demography of the state and thereby gradually take it over. Now, you know, today India's population is something like 1.2 billion, and Kashmir's population under Indian occupation is about 8 million. So you can see that there is absolutely no comparison between 8 million people and 1.2 billion people that can simply swamp the state of Kashmir. And that article has also been abrogated and Indians are now saying that we are going to go and buy property in Kashmir and very soon, of course, Kashmir's democracy will be changed. In fact, even there are two separate parts of Kashmir, or three. Uh, one is Jammu and Kashmir, and Jammu district has, has already been changed into a Hindu majority area 
because of illegal settlement of Indians from Kashmir. Whereas Kashmir, which is the Kashmir Valley, has been preserved so far with its Muslim majority. And then you have the Ladakh region, which is predominantly Buddhist. And it is now the Kashmir Valley that is also being targeted by India. And from August the 5th to the present time, with the exception of some of the demonstrations that people would just erupt, come out, and then of course you saw some of the people in this vid these videos, that they would demonstrate, but then they'll be arrested and thrown in jail. Incidentally, on September the 15th, five human rights activists and lawyers, female human rights activists and lawyers from India, went to Kashmir, to Sirinagar. That included three Hindu lawyers, female lawyers, at the Indian High Court, uh, one Sikh retired professor, a female professor, and one Muslim uh, social activist. They went to Kashmir, they met families, and this is what they were told. They said that India or Indian Occupation Army has uh, taken away at least 13,000 Kashmiri youth. At least 13,000. That's just the lower figure. In fact, other figures say that at least 25,000 Kashmiri youths have been taken away. And what the Indian Army does is, Indian Army as well as these um, racists and bigots, the fascists of India, who, who are represented by a group called RSS, which stands for Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which means roughly translated that the National you know, Defense League or, or terrorist group, basically. And incidentally, I was very surprised when I did a Google search that RSS is also registered in Canada. And last month, they actually put on their Facebook, they were doing their military exercises right here in Canada. Whoa. And our government has done nothing about it. I want to ask each and every one of you, suppose Muslims were to go and do these kinds of exercises, do you know what would happen? They'll just go and arrest every one of them, and in fact, their families as well. They'll say these are training for they are, these are people training for terrorism purposes. RSS is doing it right here in Canada. They are collecting funds to send to India to terrorize Muslims, and yet our government takes no action about this. And I think it is a challenge for each and every one of us that we have to confront our government and say, well, you need to take action against these terrorists that are training over here. We cannot remain silent about this issue. Yes. Yeah. In Kashmir, people have been locked up since August the 5th. So if you calculate, today is about the 80th or 80, 87th day, actually, since they have been locked up. We don't know whether people can get food. More critically, we don't even know whether people desperately who need medications. There may be people suffering from heart ailments. There may be people suffering from cancer. There may be people suffering from kidney diseases. They have no access to anything because they ca people cannot go to hospitals. As you saw in one of the videos, a man is taking his sick child. He cannot take him to a hospital because the army attacked them, beat up even the child. They just drove them away from there. So this is the kind of situation that, that uh, exists in Kashmir today. There is one other aspect that I want to draw everybody's attention to, and that is that India today is governed by an ideology of fascism. Make no mistakes about it. Yes. The RSS ideology is based on the Nazi ideology. In fact, RSS leaders have openly proclaimed they have actually praised Hitler in their books, in their literature. This is no secret. If you want, I can provide you links to their books. They are praising Hitler and they said, their RSS leaders have said, that we are going to do to Muslims what Hitler did to the Jews in Germany. These are their open statements that are available on the internet. This is the ideology that rules India today in India itself, and there are again videos available of what these uh, fascists are doing in India. If they don't like Muslims or whatever, they'll just go and grab them and beat them up. There are videos available of these Hindu fanatics and fascists not only beating up Muslims, in many instances beating them to death. Yes. In other instances, they get them on the ground, they uh, 
throw stones at them on their heads and then they take uh, axes and chop them in pieces. There are videos available of that. And yet, Narendra Modi is welcomed in world capitals. When he came to the United States to the U UN General Assembly, Donald Trump met him, a number of other you know, Western leaders met him. We wonder exactly what kind of values is this world now heading towards. Regrettably, you're absolutely right that these kinds of horrible things are happening, and yet there is virtually not only deadly silent uh, against such atrocities, but also welcoming these fascists in the Western world. And this fascism is not only a threat to the Muslims of India, as you know, during the Second World War, the whole world had to rise up against Nazism and fascism in, in Italy and Germany, etc. Unless and until these fascists are confronted, unfortunately, they will engulf the whole world in their ideology of fascism, and there will be total turmoil. And I want to conclude with this one final point, and that is that there is a very, very serious risk of a war erupting between India and Pakistan. You all know that both countries have nuclear weapons. India's military is at least four or five times or three, four times larger than Pakistan's. And if the Pakistani army were overwhelmed in that conflict, then I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that the Pakistani army would be forced to resort to nuclear weapons. I cannot even imagine the catastrophe that would engulf not only that region but the entire world because today the nuclear weapons that these two states have, each country has about 140, 150 nuclear weapons. There is also China next door, another nuclear power, and a little bit further is, there is the, the, the Russian uh, Federation that is also a nuclear power. And it is inconceivable that if there were any such exchange, God forbid, but it will engulf not only that region, but the entire world. And as you know, nuclear clouds recognize no natural or national boundaries. And we could have a nuclear winter uh, in, in the world. Hundreds of millions of people will die. And the world that we know it today would no longer exist. And so it is important, it is crucial that we take stock of this situation and confront the fascism that is raging through India, which is a threat not only to the Muslims of Kashmir, not only to the Muslims of India, but they are a threat to the entire world, to entire humanity. And it is time that we took stock of this. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.